this session we will first re revisit our discussion from the ninth life uh, ninth life life session that was concluded last week in a brief manner uh, then we will go through the discussion of week 10 content in a much simplified manner and in between i will provide some question relevant to the content so in today's live session unlike the discussion of uh, week 10 module videos uh, which mainly consist of evaluation methods that we have already discussed. I will follow the module distribution that you saw in the week 1 session. Okay. And thus in week 10, we will discuss about seismic repair and retrofitting of infrastructure. Okay. So in this, we will see an overview of seismic events. We will see seismic assessment of existing infrastructure. We'll talk about identification of vulnerable uh, distresses in a structure prone to seismic damage. We'll see earthquake induced distresses in a infrastructure. We'll talk about seismic strengthening uh, and we will see one case study related to seismic retrofitting. And uh, we will see some questions also from the discussion that we will do today. Okay. And finally, we will conclude the learning drawn from the interactive session. So in the last uh, last live session, we started discussing masonry. So basically masonry are the oldest building material that still finds application in uh, today's building industry. And the reason is their simplicity. Uh, masonries are basically heterogeneous material consisting of units and joints. So units are our bricks, blocks or stones and joints are composed of mortar. So we talked about, uh, we classified masonry into three categories, stone masonry, brick masonry, and concrete masonry. And for each of them, we saw example and their uni uniqueness. After the basic introduction, we looked into distresses in masonry. Uh, here we talked about different reasons for the uh, distress. These can be settlement, moisture ingress, thermal movement, chemical reaction, structure overloading and poor construction practices, aging and uh, wear, wear and tear, biological growth and earthquakes. So then we saw how we classify and identify distress. There can be different types of distresses. Few of them are shown here in the slide. So you can see uh, diagonal cracking near the joint. Here also you can see diagonal cracking. Here you can see vertical cracking. Here you can see compatibility issues that can arise between new motor and old motor. And here also you can see vertical cracking. So more of such cases we saw in the last session. We then talked about how we evaluate a masonry performance. Evaluation can be done in three ways, either by visual inspection or through non-destructive testing in which we talked about UPV, ground penetrating radar, infrared thermography and impact eco. For all these four, we understood how they function and we saw how, what, how they can detect a distress in the structure. And in destructive, we saw course sampling and testing and pullout testing. Now, after quantifying the performance, there comes repair for which we discussed several methods. So these methods are categorized into following categories. There is masonry repointing, crack stitching, grouting, reinforcement installation, surface coating and treatment, anchor installation, structural uh, strengthening and seismic retrofitting. So we had a detailed discussion for each of these category. And finally, we saw some six to seven cases where we suggested most appropriate repair method for the particular distress. So, in the discussion till date, we have seen ma several major categories of infrastructure. We have talked about concrete bridges and buildings, we talked about pavements and we talked about masonry structures. For each of them, we talked about distress reason, distress appearance, distress evaluation and finally repair and retrofitting techniques. How however, if we go back to week one session, where we introduce several reasons for distresses in the infrastructure. Most of the repair and maintenance that we have discussed till now have been related to infrastructure specific damages like material related issue, construction design related issue or due to weathering action. One more major category of distress which often are unpredictable yet very severe is the distress due to natural calamities. 
among which the most critical one is earthquake induced damage so before moving into different retrofitting and precautionary measures that are taken for earthquake damage let's have a look at overview of how earthquake in induces damage okay so an earthquake is basically a sudden uh, an earthquake is a uh, sudden or and violent shaking uh, of ground caused by the movement of tecto tectonic plates beneath the earth crust and uh, beneath the earth surface and it's a natural phenomena resulting from the release of energy stored within the earth crust okay the event of earthquake generates seismic waves uh which propagate outward from the focus or hypocenter from where the earthquake was generated to the point uh, uh from the point where the earthquake was generated and these waves propagate travels through the earth, uh, earth's interior and along its surface causing ground to shake and vibrate okay so as can as one can see in this image also there are three major points this focus where the earthquake begins okay or we can say it has hypocenter also there is epicenter the first point of interaction of earthquake to the ground level and there is fault line the line along which the movement is the maximum so you can see here also it is within a weak point in the tectonic plate where pressure within the crust is released okay so this along this line the pressure released by the seismic wave are the maximum okay now due to this earthquake uh, there is uh, the intensity and duration of shaking that occurred due to earthquake event depends upon factors such as magnitude of earthquake depth of hypocenter distance of epicenter distance from the epicenter and the geographical characteristic of area so these are several points on which an earthquake intensity will depend okay and the resulting seismic event when interacts with the infrastructure it can cause excessive stress generation in the form of vibration which damages the structural integrity okay the extent and the damage of earth uh, uh, to the infrastructure again depends upon various factors which includes the magnitude of earthquake the depth of earthquake the proximity of epicenter of the infrastructure the soil condition and the structural characteristic of building and other infrastructure element okay so any structure lying along the fault line is more prone to earthquake damage compared to a structure away from the fault line okay this is the basic essence of this last point okay now for measuring the intensity of earthquake vibration we use seismographs okay so a seismograph is a is the primary earthquake measuring uh, measurement tool instrument okay uh, the seismograph produces a digital graphic recording of the ground motion caused by the seismic wave and this recording is known as seismogram okay so such kind of vibration readings that we take these are known as seismogram which helps us to decide the intensity which helps us to record the intensity of an earthquake event okay and often you see uh, a number is assigned to a particular earthquake okay like two magnitude earthquake or five magnitude earthquake or 10 magnitude earthquake so these are representative of the intensity of seismic activity and to quantify these uh, this magnitude for uh, magnitude of earthquake we have richer magnet magnitude scale okay so according to this scale if the earthquake is of magnitude 2 or 3 it is known as very minor earthquake okay and these earthquake are usually not felt but they can be recorded by the seismograph okay or an earthquake of a scale 4 uh, they are often felt but they only do minor damage an earthquake of scale between 5 to 6 they can cause slight damage to the building an earthquake above 6 is dangerous to the building okay between 6 and 7 if my earthquake magnitude is there it can cause ma major damage to the structure Uh, if it is between seven and eight, it will again cause ma major damage with serious, uh, serious threat to the mankind also. And above eight, it will totally destroy the community near the epicenter. Okay, so this is how an uh, earthquake intensity is scaled. Okay, now for earthquake activity below five or six magnitude, we often don't care or we follow codal provisions. Okay. so we initially provide some basic measures while constructing infrastructure or basic damage repair can be done after earthquake okay minor damage repair 
However, for earthquake above six, there are serious damage and threat to both the structure and the mankind. Okay, this uh, which have been seen often in the past. Okay, a few example can be seen in this slide also. Like in the first image, you can see a massive seven magnitude earthquake caused a significant damage in the last in Alaska in two thousand eighteen. So you can see how severe the earthquake uh, damage was to, to the uh, this pavement uh, area. In the second image, you can see it uh, in Nepal when 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck in 2015, which caused massive uh, uh, damage to the society, killing almost 9,000 people and injuring over 23,000 people uh, due to earthquake damage. In the third image also you can see one such case where a 6.5 magnitude earthquake was struck in Japan in 2015 which led to serious damage to the society while in 2001 a 7.9 magnitude earthquake struck, struck the Gujarat which lasted for over two minutes and still it killed more than 19,000 people while more than uh, 1.5 lakhs were injured and nearly millions lost homes. So you can see how severe a earthquake uh, event can be to the infrastructure of the of the society. Okay. Now, for existing infrastructure which are yet to be damaged by earthquake event, it is important to have a seismic assessment to know how critical the structure can be to the seismic uh, damage, and thus decide what measures shall be taken to prevent those damage from occurring. Okay, so seismic assessment is, be, is a crucial step for evaluating the vulnerabilities in a building and structure uh, to se se seismic events. It involves comprehensive examination of buildings, uh, structural system, material, construction method and current seismic performance to identify potential weakness and deficiencies. So basically it is the examination of existing infrastructure, how well it is capable of resisting a seismic event. Okay. A detailed seismic assessment provides valuable insight into the building ability to withstand the seismic force and it helps engineers to develop effective retrofitting strategies to enhance the seismic resilience. Okay. Now, this assessment uh, is divided into six broad categories. So, let's have an overview of each of them one by one. So, first is visual inspection. So here what we do, we just visually inspect the building's interior and exterior and these includes uh, inspection for signs of structural damage such as crack, bulges, uh, leaning walls and displacements of uh, structural elements. So this is the part of visual inspection where we just visually see what is the condition of the structure. Then the second part is host uh, historical review. Okay, so this basically helps us to identify weak portions of an infrastructure. Okay, and it includes like a review of historical records, construction documents and building codes to understand the building design, construction technique and any modification or renovation over time. Okay, these information provide us valuable context for assessing the building's seismic performance and identify potential weakness in the building. Okay. So it is like historical review of the structure also and the loca locality also to judge how critical my structure is to get a, uh, to meet an earthquake event. Okay. So third is uh, structural analysis. Okay. F uh, it involves evaluating the building's uh, structural systems uh, that includes framing, load bearing elements, foundation and lateral force resisting systems. Okay. It uses analysis techniques such as finite element analysis to assess the structural response to seismic forces and identify weak points of deficiencies in a building design. So for conducting such analysis, usually what we do, we analyze the building like as a frame structure that is a beam column assembly with all the loads coming as a dead load or live load. So often you have seen a building represented like this frame. Okay. So these are beams, these are columns and all the other load we apply as dead load and live load uniformly distributed over the beam. Okay, so this is how we generally represent a structure in a form of frame. Okay, then for this frame structure we evaluate stiffness of each component and we estimate stresses and deflection at each member and this helps the engineer to 
identify potential weakness in the structure in terms of which area is more prone to get deflection which has the least stiffness which is more prone to get damaged due to some lateral forces that may come from an earthquake event okay and such analysis if is used before construction it will also help the engineer to prevent any chances of earthquake distress or need of retrofitting okay now these all frame analysis and modeling it is a lengthy discussion in itself which is usually studied as, as a separate course in structural engineering highlighting very few points here won't like help you much in the understanding so if you are not clear about such analysis either search for some book or refer to some videos lectures online and you will get a better clarity okay for the uh, sake of this course it is just important to, for us to understand the repair and retrofitting of the structures that we have already analyzed okay in the past i have also taught a little about seismic induced vibrations and how to analyze them so and those who want to recap that part they can of, uh, also see those session that on my youtube channel okay the fourth is geo technical investigation so this includes understanding the site's uh, geo technical condition which is essential for uh, assessing the building's uh, seismic risk okay it involves soil testing seismic site classification evaluation of soil structure interaction effect okay so if my soil is very weak it is more prone to uh, bear uh, like it is more prone to get damaged due to vibrations okay so geotechnical investigation is also very important for places which is very which has a very high risk for an earthquake event its soil quality there should be capable enough to take the vibration loads so that the structures above won't fail okay and these information what they do they help engineer to determine the building uh, building's threat to ground shaking or soil liquef liquefaction or other seismic hazards okay then we have seismic hazard assessment so uh, this involves evaluating the regional seism seismic uh, hazard to which building is exposed which considers factors like local geological condition proximity to fault line historical se seismic activity and ground motion amplification effect so this is basically review of the locality how prone is the location to earthquake event okay till now we saw all the points that were related to my infrastructure now this point is related to my surrounding okay so we generally rely on probabilistic seismic hazard analysis or deterministic seismic hazard hazard analysis methodology methodologies to quantify the likelihood and intensity of a seismic event okay and finally combining all these assessment five assessment we do the risk assessment okay so this involves com com combination of seismic hazard analysis structure analysis and geotechnical investigation uh, to quantify a building's risk in terms of potential loss of life loss of life but uh, property damage and economical damage if it meets a earthquake event okay and this assessment helps me to pri prioritize retrofitting measure and allocate resources effectively to mitigate the seismic risk okay now based on the assessment uh, that is carried out engineer can identify specific vulnerabilities and deficiencies in the building's structural system <coughs> that makes it prone to seismic risk okay so these uh, weakness includes uh, weak structural system so often my structure if it is equipped uh, in adequate lateral road resisting systems like insufficient shear walls or moment frames or bracing they are often very weak in resisting lateral loads okay so this comes under weak uh, structural system and such system may not be effectively able to redistribute or dissipate seismic energy leading to their failure or collapse during the earthquake okay so the same can be seen here in this building okay so in this building shear walls cross bracing and shock absorbers they were provided to resist the earthquake event okay so what shear walls does it resists it resists the lateral force cross bracing against it makes my system more moment resistive okay and shock absorbers it reduces the vibrations that are coming into the system so without these uh, my system may be weak in uh, structurally it may be weak and it won't be able to take earthquake load easily okay 
then second reason what which makes a structure prone to se- seismic damage is poor quality construction okay so poor construction pact- practices substandard materials and lack of quality control during the con- uh, construction can compromise on the integrity and the stability of a structure and common in- common issues uh, for this includes inadequate reinforcement improper detailing of uh, structure element and especially joints okay so joints are the areas which are most critical for uh, lateral loads okay so i have seen in is 1 uh, is 1893 which is related to seismic uh, uh, earthquake related uh, distresses there is a special guideline they have which they have formed is 10 uh 626 so there is this uh, specific code that has been there which is designed just for this joint uh designing for uh, structures which are prone to earthquake damage okay so this is how a poor quality construction or lack of proper design can hamper a structure okay so you can see in this image is also due to poor quality construction a lot of structural damage happened okay when this uh, the structure meant earthquake okay and non ductile construction material is again one reason which can make a structure prone to seismic damage and building constructed with the non ductile construction material such as reinforced masonry brittle concrete and weak timber are prone to seismic damage why because they lack the ability to deform and absorb energy under seismic loading which increases their risk for brittle failure and collapse during earthquake okay uh fourth one is soft story uh, and weak story buildings okay so generally soft story stories can occur in a building with uh, which have uh, open ground floors large windows and irregular layout and such stories they create weak structural ring which are prone to seismic damage okay uh another reason which makes a structure prone to earthquake is irregularities in irregularities in plane and elevation so structural in, uh, irregularities such as changes in building height setbacks or asymmetric configuration can lead to localized stress concentration and uneven stress distribution during seismic force which increases the risk of uh, building damage so here in the image you can see this is a normal building so under an earthquake event the whole building is vibrating uh, as a unit okay so that's why the drift in the building the lateral drift in the building is very low however if a building has a soft story suppose the ground floor is weak in uh, is made of is, is weak in properties or it has some irregularities so what will happen these point will become regions for stress concentration and they will deflect more than the above building and this will increase the lateral drift in the building and it will lead to collapse in the building okay so in this ways uh, a building becomes prone to uh, damage and a se- 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 seismic events okay if such assessment and identification of vulnerabilities are not properly carried out in existing infrastructure upon receiving the vibrations from earthquake event a structure often see major distresses in the form of like deep or wide longitudinal cracking can occur there can be differential settlement of the foundation if my soil is weak which can lead to collapse of uh, above structure there can be cracking in the structure along the fault line or there can be tilting of infrastructure owing to weak lateral strength okay so in the in these ways uh, distresses often appears on the infrastructure which is composed of weak materials or poor design practice or if it is not assessed properly based on the geo- geological conditions or uh, past record of earthquake okay so uh, due to this it becomes necessary to take preventive measures to retrofit a infrastructure for seismic event okay the retrofitting uh, strategies are tailored to address uh, the identified vulnerabilities and enhance the building's seismic resistance okay so we do generally retrofitting to enhance the building's ability to resist the seismic waves that are coming into it okay these measures basically focus on three common concerns improving the lateral road resistance of the structure 
सिंस सिस्मिक वाइब्रेशन आर लेटरल वाइब्रेशन इंड्यूस्ड इन द स्ट्रक्चर सो इट इज इम्पॉर्टेंट टू इम्प्रूव द लेटरल लोड बियरिंग कैपेसिटी ऑफ द स्ट्रक्चर सेकेंड पॉइंट इट इज इन्हेंसिंग द डक्टिबिलिटी सो मोर इज द डक्टिलिटी ऑफ एन इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर बेटर इट विल बी एबल टू एब्जॉर्ब द शॉक ओके एंड इट विल बी एबल टू इट विल हैव बेटर डेसिपेशन कैपेसिटी एंड इट दस इट विल हैव लोअर लोड लोअर डैमेज इंड्यूस ड्यू टू अर्थ क्विक ओके एंड थर्ड इज इम्प्रूविंग द एनर्जी डेसिपेशन कैपेसिटी विच कैन बी डन बाई हैविंग स्पेसिफिक मेम्बर्स विच कैन टेक वाइब्रेशन एनर्जीज फ्रॉम द इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर ओके and to accomplish these measure we have following techniques that are used uh, the first is adding, adding new structural element second is uh, strengthening of uh, existing components third is modifying connection and fourth is redistributing load okay so in the category of additional structural element we have addition of shear wall or adding damping devices so by shear wall we mean installing a reinforced concrete or she- steel shear wall along the building parameter or within the interior to improve the lateral stability and uh, re- re- and to resist seismic force so a shear wall what it does it increases the lateral load bearing capacity of a structure which can take the earthquake vibrations easily okay second way in which she can uh, improve this uh, uh, structure's ability to resist earthquake by adding a structural element is by adding damping devices so these include in incorporating seismic damper such as viscous damper or tune mass damper to dissipate uh, seismic energy and reduce building vibration okay in the category of strengthening the existing component we have strengthening foundation or retrofitting non ductile elements so in strengthening foundation what we can do we can do reinforcing very we can do we can reinforce on the, or upgrade the building foundation to improve the soil structure interaction and reduce the risk of settlement or overturning during the earthquake so if we will improve the soil condition beneath the structure it will be able to uh, take up more vibration and less vibration will come on the above structure so my risk uh, of settlement and overturning due to earthquake will be reduced okay fourth is uh, retrofitting non ductile elements okay so this includes in strengthening or replacing non ductile elements such as unreinforced masonry wall or brittle concrete with more resilient uh, members or systems okay why we do this because a ductile element is able to absorb energy and it will deflect le- uh, and it will be able to take the uh, waves okay it will be able to absorb the lateral uh, seismic waves okay which makes my structures uh, less prone to damage upon earthquake okay uh, while modifying the connections can be accomplished by introducing f- uh, moment frame so this involves installing steel or concrete mo- uh, concrete moment frames to in- enhance this building's ability to resist lateral load and prevent structural deformation okay and finally we have base isolation uh, which uh, involves redistribution of load or vibration by opting for a separate unit be- beneath the structure so implementing base isolation system is to decouple the building from the ground motion and minimize the transfer of seismic force to the superstructure okay so what uh, in very simple term if we say what base isolation does it is just uh, disconnecting my above structure from the ground okay so if there will be some motion in the ground that motion will first transfer to the base isolators okay and then to the above structure okay so then this way the vibrations are not directly coming into the structure and it, they come into the structure in a very reduced form which prevents their collapse during earthquake okay so these are different methods in which we can retrofit a building a infrastructure which is prone to damage by earthquake okay either by adding shear wall or by adding damping devices or by strengthening the foundation or by retrofitting non ductile elements or by introducing moment frames or by using base isolation okay in this diagram also one can see how different strengthening measures can be applied on the building frame and what is their effect so first you can see infill walls or shear walls uh, in the moment frame you can see if we place shear walls okay so what it does it increases the strength and reduces the drift so if some load is coming like this in this direction lateral load so due to this shear wall my drift that is happening in the building will be reduced 
okay adding braces so you can see like this steel braces are added in the infrastructure so again what it does it increases the strength and reduces the drift so again if some lateral load will come on the structure the so due to steel braces that load will be distributed and the final uh, drift in the structure will be very low then there is adding buttresses so this involves adding uh, supports on the side of the building okay and what they does it uh, provides uh, containment to the building so like we talked in column strengthening that we do confining due to frp so it is also kind of confinement of a building okay and due to this confinement what happens the lateral load bearing capacity of the structure is increased so the drift that will ha that was happening due to earthquake it will be reduced okay then there is movement frames so you can see here in middle uh, movement frames were uh, the non-ductile frames were replaced with ductile frames okay so what it does it again increases strength it does containment and it reduces the drift okay then completely rebuild so here you can see the cross section of the beams and columns were increased okay so what it does uh, it increases the load bearing capacity of my building uh, and uh, thus it provides high seismic uh, capacity and damage control to the building and finally we have isolate building so using base isolation if we will isolate the building so what will happen it will pro it will provide protection and damage control to the building so if my ground is vibrating my base uh, these isolators they will vibrate more but my building will vibrate very less so in this way the vibrations that are coming on the building are reduced and from by an extensive amount okay so among these discussed categories the most most of them are related to enhancing the ductility or reducing the lateral drift of a frame structure however one category which uh, without disturbing the existing infrastructure design reduces the seismic damage is the base isolation okay so in this method is often commonly used followed for major infrastructure okay and it has been reported quite successful in mitigating the earth earthquake damage okay so in base isolation what we do uh, isolated rubber bat uh, rubber pad is placed below the structure to separate it from the direct wave coming from the ground okay so when earthquake strikes the building since the rubber is flexible it tends to deform and deflect by absorbing the seismic forces as rubber deforms the time of oscillation increases and thus the magnitude of seismic force transferring to the above structure decreases and thus the lateral movement of the structure reduces so here you can see a structure without base isolation how much drift is happening in it and the same structure due to base isolation uh, how very little or minimal drift happened in the structure and why so because with the installation of a uh, rubber pad the isolated rubber pad my period of vibration it increased so due to that the seismic force capacity it was reduced which was initially of magnitude 1 it reduced to a magnitude of 0.2 to 0.3 okay and due to this the lateral drift also decreased okay so due to increase in the period what happened the lateral drift initially which was 6 inch it reduced till 0.5 to 1 inch due to application of isolated rubber okay So, so we will see. Uh, we will let's see a case study to uh, understand the uh, better understand uh, our discussion today. Like how let's see a case study in how practically a uh, seismic retrofitting is done in a building. Okay, so this case study is about a city and county building in the Salt Lake City okay in, in the western parts of united states so so the background was this building was constructed in 1894 and it is a highly unreinforced uh, may, it is made of highly unreinforced brick and sandstone structure and it uh, measures around 130 by 250 feet in plane and with five main floors and a 12 story uh, tower okay the seismic vulnerability of the structure is aggravated by its proximity to the fault zone so it is in it is located in a very risky area 
ओके एंड बिल्डिंग हैज बीन रिपोर्टेड टू रिकॉर्ड डैमेज फ्रॉम वेरियस अर्थक्विक विथ लार्जेस्ट वन विच अकर्ड इन नाइनटीन थर्टी फोर ऑफ अ मैग्नेट ऑफ सिक्स पॉइंट वन ओके एंड नाउ द कंसल्टेंट वॉज आज इन द फ्यूचर अर्थक्विक इवेंट्स ओके सो सेवरल ऑल्टरनेटिव रियालिटेशन सिस्टम फॉर द बिल्डिंग्स वर स्टडीड इन द मिड नाइनटीन एटीज ओके द कन्वेंशनल सिस्टम इन विजन यूटिलाइजेशन ऑफ शेयर वॉल Uh, which required removal of costly architectural finishes such as oak uh, wainscoting and ornamental plasters okay however to since these things were not very practical to implement to minimize the destruction and replacement of these finishes a base isolation system was selected for the retrofitting of this building okay now how the base isolation was carried out so first the base isolation solution required the replacement of concrete slab uh, replacement of first floor with a concrete slab on the metal deck supported by the steel beam and this was done to isolate the building from the ground so here you can see the enlarged view of the base floor so this was the concrete wall okay just to isolate this concrete wall from the base what they did they uh, they introduced a metal deck supported by a steel beam beneath the concrete slab okay so this was uh, this helped to isolate the building from the ground apart from this partial replacement on other floors were also provided a plywood uh, diaphragm was installed on at the ceiling level of the fourth floor and to support the top masonry below the first floor also masonry walls were clinched between pairs of reinforced concrete side beams and tied together okay with cross beams and uh, post tension rods and all these activities uh, so several like different different activities they were provided on different different four floors also apart from base isolation and these activities ensured that there is a continuity in the ductility ductile capacity of my building okay since for higher floor levels where vibrations can be higher drift can be controlled or limited okay so for these uh, for these reasons some other uh, retrofitting measures are also provided okay for the base level once the concrete slab was uh, so concrete side beams were installed the portion of the masonry wall and the pin and un under the cross beam were improved uh, removed permitting installation of base isolators okay and a total of 1 uh, 447 isolated bearings were installed uh, uh, with uh, beneath the building okay what was the end result okay so before repair the response factor indicated that the free field ground ground acceleration was 0.2 g with a site period of 1 to 1.4 second however after repair a base isolation system effectively reduced that uh, acceleration of the ground floor from 0.2 g to 0.07 g by increasing the time period of vibration to 2 seconds okay so in this way you can see how without affecting the integrity of the structure or the or the like uh, appearance of the structure how the structure was made safe from any kind of earthquake related damages okay so okay so this was how seismic repair via base isolation is generally carried out this topic again can be very deep if we look into the designing uh, designing of each part of base isolation system however as a part of this course it was important for us to just understand the working and the measures which i hope is clear to everyone now any doubt in the discussion that we have till now so we first started we had with understanding what is seismic damage how a structure becomes vulnerable to seismic damage how we can assess a building for uh, seismic damage and how in different ways we can retrofit a building to make it safe safe from earthquake event any doubt in this discussion part okay so if no doubts we'll move ahead okay so let's see some questions related to how a uh, 
related to whatever we have discussed today okay so these are few questions so try to answer to these questions by yourself else i will tell you the solution so i will uh, i will mute myself for a couple of minutes and you can uh, by the time you can uh, answer the questions okay so let's see the answers to these questions now okay so first question says what is the primary objective for retrofitting a earthquake uh, damage infrastructure options are to increase aesthetic appeal to reduce energy hello consumption. what happened to your land okay so let's see the answers to these questions the first question is what is the primary objective of retrofitting earthquake damage infrastructure so the answer correct answer will be to improve the seismic resilience of the structure okay <coughs> second is which of the following is not a common retrofitting technique for earthquake damage infrastructure adding shear wall installing moment frame strengthening foundation or painting exterior surface so painting exterior surface is not a uh, retrofitting technique by adding shear wall we improve the lateral capacity by introducing moment frame we uh, improve the moment uh, resisting capacity or the deflection control we do by strengthening the foundation also we improve the uh, we do the damage damage control by uh, reducing the risk of foundation failure or settlement ground settlement okay what uh, base isolation in what does base isolation involve in retrofitting a uh, infrastructure for earthquake damage adding additional weight to the building no decoupling the structure from the ground yes this is the correct answer okay so in base isolation what we do we like break the connection of the structure from the ground by adding a rubber pad in between which will vibrate and absorb the seismic energy and very less energy will come into the structure okay so these are further some more questions so first question is which factor is not considered while selecting retrofitting measures for earthquake damage infrastructure type and extent of damage structural condition weather condition or seismic hazard so generally weather condition we generally don't take into account when we are talking about uh, like selecting measures for earthquake damage infrastructure okay type and extent of damage it helps us to dictate how severe my damage is structural condition again it helps me to dictate what are the weak points within the structure and seismic hazard it helps me to dictate how much prone my structure is to further earthquake damage okay how do engineer assess seismic damage to infrastructure via visual inspection structural analysis geotechnical investigation and all of them so all of them is the correct answer okay so from visual in inspection we judge if there are some cracks in the structure or not or weak location in the structure structure analysis again it helps me to dictate what is my load bearing capacity of the structure and what all areas are prone to get damaged during earthquake uh, geotechnical investigation it, it helps me to investigate the soil quality whether my soil is strong enough or not to bear the structure load as well as the damages that may come during an earthquake event which is a stakeholder can facilitate the retrofitting process for earthquake damage infrastructure engineer building owners government agencies and all so here also all of the above will the correct answer okay so all engineer building owner and government agencies all are needed for for proper decision making for retrofitting process okay then there are couple of more questions what is the purpose of seismic retrofitting certification to increase the insurance premium to demonstrate uh, compliance with building code to discourage retrofitting effort or to limit the building occupation this is uh, the certification is to demonstrate the compliance with the building code that the structure is properly retrofitted as per standards okay what is the approximate duration of retrofitting project okay a few hours no several weeks to month years or indefinite so generally a retrofitting process for a, a seismic induced damage generally takes from weeks to month okay if the proper planning and executions are done okay so in this slide you have all the answers if you want to revisit 
and if you have any doubts regarding these answers and why these answers are selected you can always ask me uh, uh, in the comment section okay so this was all for this week if you have any doubts i will be there in the meet for uh, a, like 15 to 20 minutes more you can ask me your queries by the time i will mute myself thank you